in the quiet corners of Northampton, England, a vibrant young woman named India Chipchase embarked on a night out with friends. What should have been an ordinary night turned into a haunting tragedy after an unsettling encounter with a man whose sinister motives would lead to unspeakable horrors. This is the tragic case of India Chipchase. India was born on Christmas Eve in 1995 to Suzanne and Jeremy Chipchase. She was the eldest of her three siblings. She had two sisters, Lulu and Pia, and a brother named Harry. Her father, a doctor, resided in Adelaide, Australia, while her mother, who ran her own business, lived in Northampton, England. Even though India primarily resided with her mother, she shared a close bond with both her parents. She also had a tight-knit relationship with her siblings, and the family was, by all accounts, content. Upon completing high school, India pursued a diploma in health and social care at Northampton College. Her passion for healthcare was evident in her hard work. She interned as an assistant at St. Andrew's Hospital and aspired to become a life-saving paramedic. To support her medical aspirations, she worked as a barmaid at the Calling Tree Pub in Hunsbury. Described as vibrant, energetic, and exceptionally beautiful, India often caught the attention of those around her. Those who had the honor of being her friend recall that her beauty was only preceded by her kindness and charisma. She was multi-talented, practicing the saxophone and also playing sports. In 2014, India began dating professional rugby player and Kiwi expat Evan Rehana, and eventually the two fell very much in love. However, one year later, the two would end their relationship while remaining good friends. On the 29th of January in 2016, India went out with her friends for drinks at the Calling Tree Pub, the same place she worked. After spending some time at that pub, they decided to head into the city. They attended NB's Cocktail Bar and Pub, which was a popular bar in the area, situated on Bridge Street. The group reportedly spent the evening laughing, dancing, and drinking heavily. At some point, India became separated from her friends. At around 12.45 a.m., India's friends began looking for her inside the pub, but they could not find her. They assumed that she had gone back home. India, however, had actually been escorted out of the club after she had fallen. She told one of the doormen that she wanted to go home, so the doorman arranged for a taxi. The doorman says he put her inside the taxi. However, the driver asked for her fare up front. India refused and got out of the car. She then tried getting back inside of the club. However, the doorman refused to let her in as they believed she was too intoxicated. India was then captured on the bar's CCTV, trying to call somebody. It was later found that she had tried to call her boyfriend, Grant Hare. They had recently started dating. However, the call went straight to voicemail. Records show she kept trying to call Grant, but that the call went straight to voicemail. Grant was out with friends at the time at a separate bar. However, the loud music meant he could not hear his phone and soon his battery ran out. Grant later said the pair were, quote, not quite girlfriend and boyfriend yet. One witness later said that India seemed to be in distress and may have been crying while trying to get through to someone on the phone. A few minutes later, at 1.11 a.m., while India stood outside looking at her phone as if trying to send or read messages, a bald-headed man wearing a jacket and a backpack was seen approaching her. The pair seemed to have a conversation, at which point India and the man were seen together on CCTV getting into a taxi. Witnesses recall seeing the man putting his hands around her waist and overheard him say, quote, we'll make sure we get you home in a taxi safely.
During the journey, India sent a series of Snapchats, including one which read, quote, where our club? The taxi driver later told police that the man kept on changing his street directions rather than giving his address directly. The cabbie recalls that at first the man told him to take them to McDonald's, but when the driver pulled down Bridge Street, the man changed his mind and said to go to a different McDonald's. He then told the driver to pull over at a BP garage where he got out of the car for four minutes. When he got back in the car, he directed the driver to the end of Stanley Road. He told the taxi driver to let them out several hundred meters from his flat. A witness, Patrick Francis, later told police that he was on Stanley Road when he saw India being led into a house. Patrick said that he was smoking a cigarette in the early morning hours of the 30th of January when he saw a young woman and a, quote, much older man walking side by side down Stanley Road. The witness recalled, quote, she seemed as if she was drunk because she was holding on to the railing and the guy with her was by her side. The witness recalls that the older man was leading India by the arm and opened the door to guide her inside. This would be the last time India was seen alive. Grant remembers that he arrived back at his home at 3 a.m. after partying with his friends. After he put his phone on the charger, he realized he had nine missed calls as well as several text messages from India. He immediately made several calls to her, but they went to voicemail. He assumed that she had likely dozed off and decided to wait until morning to speak with her. Later in the morning, India's mother woke up to find she was not in her bed. She figured that India may have stayed at a friend's home. She tried calling her several times, but the call went straight to voicemail. At 4 p.m., when India failed to arrive to her job as a barmaid at the Calling Tree pub, everyone became extremely worried. Her mother reported India missing to the police. A massive search was launched for the young woman, and her family initiated a social media campaign to try and find her. Police spoke to India's friends and questioned people at the bar. They also checked the CCTV footage and found out about the bald man who was last seen with India. One of the police officers actually recognized the man on the CCTV footage. He was 52-year-old Edward Tenniswood. Tenniswood had been out on bail for an unrelated sexual assault case from 2005. He had recently been charged for the assault, but had been granted bail pending further inquiries. The criminal was described as an oddball and a friendless loner by his neighbors. On the 31st of January, the police tracked India's phone to Tenniswood's house on Stanley Road. They knocked on his door, but no one answered. They then broke down the door and entered the room, only to be met with a disturbing scene. The 52-year-old had a severe case of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. His entire house was covered with dust sheets, including the furniture and kitchen appliances. Even the utensils were covered. He was so frightened of germs that he covered his laptop in cling film and still wore rubber gloves when using it. Investigators found several newspaper clippings of women, including former model Heather Stewart White, who bore a striking resemblance to India. When police made their way to the upstairs bedroom, they found India's fully clothed body lying on a mattress. A sheet had been drawn up to her chin and her long black hair was arranged by tennis wood in what police described as a quote, halo. Her body was near a book which had been left open on a page that showed romantic images of scantily clad women. Officers found the young woman's mobile phone in a box under the stairs. Her shoes and her handbag were stored neatly in a neighboring bedroom. India's blood was found in the downstairs lounge near bottles of alcohol. An autopsy revealed that she had 33 separate injuries on her body including evidence of blunt force trauma to her head and bruising to both hips. Tenniswood's blood was found underneath one of her fingernails, suggesting she had fought for her life. She had also been assaulted and was eventually strangled to death. Police started searching for Tenniswood right away. They soon found CCTV footage of him entering the Ibis Hotel in Northampton on January 30th at 9.30 p.m., 
Later, he would use the hotel's computer to access news websites where he specifically searched for information on India. At 6.47 p.m. on January 31st, three hours after India's body was first found, police arrived at the Ibis Hotel and found Tenniswood watching TV in the lounge. Surprisingly, he was neither shocked nor terrified. He instead said, quote, I'm surprised you were so quick. You didn't take very long to find me. I suppose you've been to the house. You've found what you're looking for. Tenniswood was charged with the rape and murder of India Chip Chase. Officers noted that he had scratch marks on his face and friction marks on his legs, as well as gashes to the left side of his neck. At the murder trial, he claimed that he and India had actually had consensual sex and that her death was an accident. Edward Tenniswood gave his statement to the jury as if he were on stage. He appeared to enjoy the attention of the audience so much that a police officer commented, quote, he was getting off on it all. The judge repeatedly told the defendant to keep his sentences short, but he refused, instead going into tasteless and inappropriate detail. Tenniswood told the court that he had bonded with the 20-year-old in the street outside of the club because both of them had been refused entry. He promised her that he'd drop her at home safely, but only after a drink at his place. He said that she willingly went back to his flat and that they shared a tender moment opposite a large mirror in his bedroom. Spectators say it was eerie how Tenniswood spoke about India as if he had known her for years. He said that they sat down on the bedroom floor and, quote, she just makes this incredibly moving comment, which at the time affected me quite a lot as well. It was a very sweet, very India thing to do. Our reflection in the mirror was framed, and she said, oh, look, it looks like we are in the middle of an oil painting. She had her arm around me and squeezed. It was sort of like, I suppose we were posing for a selfie. He told the court that during their consensual, quote, vigorous lovemaking, India had moved his hands to her neck before giving what he recalls was an exhaling gasp. He said of her death, quote, I, in my over-eagerness to please her, either sustained the pressure just too long or just gripped too tightly. At one point, Tenniswood actually asked for a dummy to be brought into court so that he could illustrate the lovemaking and the subsequent accidental strangulation. At one moment during the trial, the judge had to ask jurors to leave the courtroom as India's relatives were visibly upset by Tenniswood's graphic testimony. Tenniswood went on to describe how he cuddled up to India as she lay dead on the mattress. He claimed that he thought she was in a deep sleep or maybe in a coma. He then says he fell asleep and when he woke up, he assumed that she was still in a deep sleep. He told the court how he spent time trying to wake her up, but then got dressed and went through her handbag instead, claiming he was looking for some sign of a pre-existing medical condition, which may have put her in a diabetic coma. He also told jurors that he feared she may have had a stroke or a brain injury from a drunken fall. But after realizing she was dead, he claimed to have reclothed India to be, quote, respectful. He then went out to get a kebab to clear his mind. Tenniswood then spent the next 22 hours drinking lager in an Ibis hotel room until police would later arrest him. The court also heard that he drank up to three boxes of red wine per day and usually kept in his home six one and a half liter bottles of cheap Sainsbury wine. When asked about the newspaper clippings of several women found in his apartment, Tenniswood claimed, quote, they remind me of ex-girlfriends. He said that he kept the cuttings of pictures of beautiful women as ornaments. He said to the jury, quote, I've had a hugely unsuccessful life, but have been very lucky and had some very attractive girlfriends. He even claimed to have had a relationship with Heather Stewart White herself, who released a statement to say she had never met Tenniswood and had no relationship with him. The prosecution said that his account was nothing more than a series of lies and presented several pieces of evidence. They argued Tenniswood turned his sick, violent fantasies into reality after he found India in a drunk and vulnerable state outside of Northampton's NB nightclub. 
They say he took her back to his squalid home in a taxi in the early hours of Saturday, January 30th. Prosecutors allege that it is very likely his motive was sexual from the beginning, and when India resisted him, he was determined to first have sex and then strangle her. They say that he held her until she was unable to resist anymore. While Tennis Wood claimed to have failed to notice India's lifeless body, despite having reclothed her, they also point out that he wore surgical type latex gloves possibly in order to not leave any more evidence or because of his OCD. Prosecutors then state that he callously abandoned the body and instead went to a hotel. The prosecution emphasized that instead of raising the alarm, Tenniswood went out for 20 minutes to get a kebab and then spent the next 22 hours drinking in a hotel room. When he was arrested, he had a rucksack in which he was carrying a kitchen knife and a pair of latex gloves. Traces of India's blood was found on the gloves. It is believed that when Grant called India after reaching home, she was already dead. When Tenniswood was arrested, he was found with gashes to his neck and marks on his arms and legs, which suggested that India had put up a struggle. This led to Tenniswood's blood being left behind on one of her fingernails. The prosecution also pointed out that there were several bruises on India's body, which showed that there was a prolonged infliction of pain and not simply an accidental one. India's toxicology report revealed that she had three times more alcohol in her system than the legal driving limit. The prosecution pointed out that India would have been in a state of mental confusion and that she could not have done any of the things that Edward described. The prosecution also presented three witnesses who had previously suffered violence at the hands of Edward Tenniswood. One of the women said that he tried to throttle her and then kissed her after he got angry when she was a teenager. On another occasion, she claimed that he pinned her down and held a knife to her throat. Another witness said that he put his hands around her neck when she was trying to get away from him. A third victim, a male neighbor, said that he was physically attacked by Tenniswood in the previous year. He recalls that Tenniswood put his hands around his neck, quote, as if he was going to strangle me. Afterwards, Tenniswood asked the neighbor to go out for a drink, which the neighbor declined. Tenniswood reportedly told the neighbor that he had been in the army and had been trained to kill people with his bare hands. After that incident, the neighbor said that he avoided Tenniswood at all costs. The jury at Birmingham Crown Court took one hour and 45 minutes to convict Tenniswood of rape and murder after a two-week trial. Sentencing him, Mr. Justice Saunders said, quote, This was a terrible crime. It was committed because the defendant was determined to satisfy his own sexual desires on an attractive and much younger woman. It was a crime of utter depravity. The judge sentenced Edward Tenniswood to life imprisonment with a minimum of 30 years in prison before applying for parole. India's family, watching from the public gallery, wept as the verdict was read out. Her father, Jeremy, and mother, Sue, said that the death of their daughter had left, quote, a huge void. In a statement to the press, her father said, quote, I sincerely hope there's no possibility that another woman ever falls into the hands of my daughter's murderer. Her mother later spearheaded a safeguarding campaign called Northampton Guardians, which aims to protect women when they're out on the town. Volunteers patrol the streets in order to protect vulnerable women who may be out on their own. This is all done in memory and honor of India. If you like what we do and want to see more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much to our patrons. If you would like to support this channel, you can visit the link in our bio below.